My name is Grant Fritchie. This is my contact information. I am the scary DBA, okay? If you have questions after today on this or any other topic, please get in touch. I answer my email. Uh, if, if you were here for my pre-con, you already heard this joke, but I'll tell it to everyone else who wasn't here. If you send me a 30-page document, my answer to your email will be my consulting rate, and I think that's fair. But if you ask a question, I will respond with an answer. All right? Everybody okay? I'll put this up again at the end. All right, let's talk about database deployments, database automation, deployment automation. It's a really cool thing, right? What you're gonna do is you've got development going on, you've got multiple people in development, they're doing all kinds of stuff, they're running things in and out of source control, they've got triggers firing off that runs continuous integration, that does a build, test, publish, that all stuff goes out, gets through some sort of artifact repository, generates a script, the script gets deployed to QA, gets deployed to testing, gets deployed to pre-prod, and off it goes to production, right? Or, I know, I was talking fast, that was on purpose. Or, you develop straight on production, right? Come on, nod your heads. <laughs> Here's the deal. You wanna get to a place where you can deploy continuously. That's not to say all your deployments are automatic. They may not be. You can do deployments that are manual and continuous. You want to get to a place where you can do deployments that you feel comfortable about. The, the, the worst thing in the world is deploying like this. If the first time you're running the script is on production, you're doing it wrong. And I know a lot of people are like, well, no, I tested the script. You, the whole script? Well, no, we tested it in pieces. And then you modify it before you run it on product. And it's like, oh, no, no, no. You want to get to the place where you're doing this in an automated fashion. You want it to be clear. You want it to be simple. Now, I can talk about all of this all day long. I love this topic. I am a process freak. But I want to narrow it down just a little bit. I just want to talk about automation outside of your development process. I want to talk about continuous integration, which actually is kind of part of your development process. But I want to talk about CI. I want to talk about testing pre-prod and production and mechanisms for getting between these and processes for getting between these. And this is a generic process. I'm not telling you how to do your own development. It's not my fault. I haven't touched it. <laughs> Except the one earpiece that keeps popping off. My head's too big or something. Anyway, still good? All right. All I want to talk to you about is the process of your development. There's a certain number of steps that you ought to go through, and there's a bunch of tools out there that can help you, and I'll talk about some of the tools. Let's keep going. This is the goals for the session. It really is talking about process. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna read this for you, you guys can read it. It, the whole idea is to get to a place where you feel comfortable with your process. It's not about your skill set. It's not about your skill set as a DBA. It's not about your skill set as a, as a developer. It's about having a comfort with a process that allows you to be able to be ready for a production deployment at any point. At any point. We need to go to prod. Cool, let's go. That's the, that's the goal. Okay, so it's not, it's not you, it's your process that we have to work on. So continuous delivery. These are not equal. Continuous delivery and continuous deployment are not the same thing. Continuous deployment, in theory, is going out to your production server all the time. You might as well dev on prod. Continuous delivery is the ability to prepare for making sure you are production ready at any point, that you've got testing, that you've got methodology in place that allows you to protect your production server. Now, who in here is straight up, and, and anyone who's on my pre-con knows this question, don't cheat, who is straight up, I am only a developer, that's all I do? One, two, three, cool. This is actually a good audience for that. 
Um, welcome. You will not be picked on in here today. Other days I pick on developers, but not today. Today this is all about how good you guys are and how bad we are at our jobs. Who in here is a DBA straight up, that's all I do? Then everyone else already knows the joke. Who does IT stuff? Okay. You get people raising their hands twice. Wait, I like that last answer better. Okay, so really seriously, you're doing development, development's going on, great. You've got, you've got development, I I'm gonna make some assumptions. I'm assuming you have some level of development, you're not developing on prod, probably, most of the time. Yes? Okay. You probably have some level of testing. Wh what, the degree to which that testing is going on, you've got something, yeah? And then, you know, unless you've gotten an alert in the last 30 seconds, you have a prod server or servers, right? Okay, cool. Here's the deal. I want to focus on continuous integration. I love continuous integration. Continuous integration is the coolest thing in the world. It's something developers do all the time and DBAs never do. And it's crazy. We should be taking advantage of it. The thing is, is the last 50 years, developers have spent all kinds of time figuring out how to work on a team and how to deliver software successfully out to a production server from that team. Now in that same last 50 years, what a DBA has been working on? How to say no. No, no, that's, well no, we have been working on that too. But we've been working on disaster recovery, um, you know, uh, high availability, all kinds of other fun stuff that, that is, you know, vital to the business but not part of that whole team development thing. And so what we've not been paying attention to is what the developers have been doing. And they've been doing some really cool stuff. And CI is one of them. Now you work with CI, and the idea is you can test your stuff on a continuous basis, which allows you to generate an artifact on the fly over and over again. Artifact, in this case, would be what? T-SQL, right, just a script a tested script, it's all we're going for. Now the tested script, we run it a million times in development, we run it a million times on prod, when we're, I mean on test, on test, on test. <laughs> and then when we're ready to go to prod, we have an approval gate. Now that approval gate could be a DBA standing on the bridge. You cannot pass until I have reviewed this script. Could be. Or it could be that you've got a process that's that run that script 50 times. The DBA goes, oh yeah, it's gone through all the tests. Whew, off it goes. But it still gets that approval before it goes through a continuous deployment process out to the production server. Is everyone okay with this? Any questions, comments, suggestions? Rocks, money, okay. So if you wanna do this, you need four things. You've gotta get your database and source control. Who here already puts the whole database, not like, oh yeah, we put stored procedures in. The whole database goes into source control. Who does that already? Wow, half the room, wow. Very well done, okay, cool. And who here has a CI process running with their database today? Not half the room, okay. That's maybe a tenth or so, okay, cool. The whole idea, once you get CI running, then you can start doing automated testing. CI is just a step to automated testing. CI itself doesn't do a whole lot for you, although I'm gonna show you some, um, we'll do some demos, show you some stuff. But it's a step towards automated testing. And once you've got automated testing, then you get automated deployment. Because you can build a process around the automated testing that gives you a level of comfort, a level of assurance, that wonderful feeling that your phone's not gonna go off at 3 a.m. after you release the script, okay? That's what we're going for. So how do you get your database under version control? You gotta do it. Um, there are a number of different tools. If you don't use tools, you won't get it done. If you're doing it, is anybody in here doing it manually? Scripting them out by hand? Everybody's using a tool. Oh, somebody's using, don't stop. Stop doing it manually, mainly because, are you on a team, sir? And does your whole team do it all the time, or are you tasked with doing it? Yes. See, like I've done this. <laughs> I've 
couple of times. That's what happens. One person who goes, yeah, of course we should put this in source control. And you go to the team, we should put this in source control. How do we do it? Oh, it's manual. Cool, let me know when it's done. That's the answer every time. So you give them tools. What tools? Microsoft gives you a free one. Anyone here have a Microsoft Developer Network license, MSDN? Okay, SQL Server Database Tools, SSDT. Works great, connects straight up to source control. You can script out your entire database, every single object put into source control. Done. Cool. I work for a company that also sells tools that does that. I'm not gonna talk about them, but they also do it. Make sure you train your people, make sure you build often. How do you build often? Ah, continuous integration. Okay, so let's talk CI for a little bit. Once you've got the code repository, and you have to do that first, and half the room has already done that, the other half of the room is gonna get it done uh, day after tomorrow. I'm not kidding, it's too, too simple. We're not, I'm not gonna demo that bit. It's too simple. You can get your database and source control. Then, you gotta start working on build automation. Let me tell you, that's the hard part. But I'm gonna make a proposal. I want you to try getting your database in the source control. I want you to try automating builds. And I'm gonna talk about two different kinds of builds, and I want you to go for one of them. And I'll tell you which one in a minute. The whole idea of getting CI, though, is you get functional testing. You get testing of the deployment process, you get testing of your scripts, and you get automation of both those. And this is our goal. You don't want to be doing this manually. You want to automate, automate, automate. You want to practically automate yourself out of a job. And here's the glory of it, you won't. When I started doing this kind of stuff myself, and, I, and, I, and when I'm saying all this, it's like, this is all stuff I've done. This is not, this isn't, you know, hey, I've got this idea, let's try it out. This is, this is I've successfully accomplished this. I was working with three development teams. And we were doing deployments you know, multiple times during the week. We had development deployments, QA deployments, um, financial testing deployments, staging deployments, um, load testing deployments, and then production deployments. So it was a lot of deploying. And I'm doing it all like this. Now we started figuring out, you know, one, I was making a ton of mistakes. Right? I was screwing stuff up left and right. I missed this script, I forgot that, I typoed here fat-fingered, which server am I on, right? A few people are smiling, good, good. Because <laughs> you've done it, right? So I started automating it. First we, we used, um, at the time it was Data Dude. We got our databases in the source control. And so now we had, we knew what changes were being made. The whole team used it, all the development team, all the DBA team, everybody used source control. Um, there's, there's a phrase that should be in your head. If it's not in source control, it doesn't exist. And this is the hard one for DBAs, because DBAs are going, well, yeah, it exists, it's right there on my database. Really? Not anymore. Get it back. Oh, I've got a backup. Of, oh, I didn't run that one last night. Ah, okay, well, I've got it over here in source control. You want to automate these things, because what happens is, is that I was supporting three teams. Started automating it, and my boss is going, wow, this is running really well. I have a fourth team I want you to help. Sure, no problem, I can do that. Fifth team, sixth team, crap, this hurts. Okay, I'm gonna have to do some more automation. Oh yeah, this is working, great. Seventh team, eighth team, ninth team. I'm supporting nine development teams. And how did I do it? Automation, 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 automation. Lots and lots of scripting. PowerShell is my bestest buddy in the world. And it's not because I'm a genius, it's not. I mean, this was just days, weeks, months of work. But you automate. The cool thing is, is I did all this before the, we had all these neat <coughs> tools that I'm gonna show you in just a minute. So I did it manually and got to the same place that I can get you guys to in about two days. It took me, you know, about nine months. <laughs> but we, now it's much easier. And so you can do all this and generate the artifact, generate that T-SQL script. Now, remember, I told you there were two builds. The easy one, the fast one, the one I want you to start with, is a complete deployment. It is so simple. What you're gonna do is you're gonna have a little server off on the side. I don't care if it's in Azure, you know, I mean, everyone listen to, the, to Mark and everybody this morning. 
spin up an Azure VM. By the way, everyone, almost everyone in here raised their hand, I have an MSDN license, yes. You realize that also gives you a free Azure account. Nod your head or go. <gasps> it gives you a free Azure account so you can go and play and or use this for your testing. So you spin up a VM locally, on the cloud, I don't care where, or an, a local instance, great. Heck, do it on your laptop if you have to, okay? But you spin up an instance of SQL Server, you get your database and source control, and then you start doing this. Drop the database and rebuild it from source control completely. Drop the database, rebuild it from source control. Well, I'm not gonna be dropping my production database, dude. That doesn't work for me. I know, but this is your first level of testing. This is going to validate, one, that you can drop a database, and two, that you can rebuild it from source control and get it right. Oh yeah, well we hit this thing where it wasn't building the tables in the right order, okay. Fix it. Okay, yeah, now it's working, now it's automated, great. What you've now got is functional testing of a full build of your database. Ta-da, you've done automation and your first build and your first test all in one step. Now just keep going. The way to do it is to think about eating the elephant. How to eat the elephant? Oh, surely you know. Say it out loud, somebody's gotta say it, or it can't go on. Small pieces. One bite at a time, right? That you, you can't eat it any faster than that. Yep, everyone okay with that? So nod your head. All right, cool. Because if you can, I wanna watch. We'll get a camera, this'll be cool. Now, once you've got that done, then you gotta do the hard stuff. This is the easy bit, I want you, and I'm, tell, I'm serious. For everyone who's already got their database and source control, Thursday morning you will have all this set up. It's that easy. Don't set, try to set up the next bit Thursday afternoon because you'll hate me. Let that run for a little bit, cogitate about it. Then, you're gonna wanna start setting up incremental deployments. Incremental deployments are the hard ones. You can do it all through your, through your continuous integration environment. I'm gonna show you one in a minute. It's just harder. What you're gonna have to do is get like a backup of production, if possible, with clean data. And I wanna emphasize that. I'll tell you a quick little story of something that I did and, and I managed not to get fired for it. Um, I had a development team working with me and they're like, oh, we need a copy of production. Of course, I gave them a copy of production because everyone has to have a copy of production, right? Nod your heads, especially the developers in the room. Said developer had a sense of humor and some interesting web browsing habits. And so uh, he was working on a little bit of a functionality called email. You might know where this is going. I gave him a copy of our production database with our entire customer list and their email addresses. And I didn't clean it. And he was testing his little script and sent an email using the database list that consisted of a photograph. Yeah, one of those photographs. So, clean your data first. Otherwise you get in these really, really long meetings where you try to discuss how to prevent this from ever happening again. <laughs> right, you don't wanna go there. So you clean your data, then you use whatever tools you're using, SSDT does this, you can look at some of the other third-party tools. You generate a differential script that just will make the changes that, the differences between what's currently in source control and what's currently on your production system. With that differential script, you test that differential script again using your CI process. If it fails, cool. What you've just done is test your script deployment against a production server way before you get to production, and you've done it in an automated fashion because you can do all this automatically. It's a win. If it fails, you find out why it failed and you fix it. Is it a problem with the tool? Fix the, you know, make the changes you have to make in the tools. Is it a problem with the code inside of source control? Make those changes there. Wherever the problem was, you identify that, you make the change, rerun the test, which doesn't require you to do anything. It's because it's automatic. I'm gonna show you how to do that in just a second. Easy, easy stuff. 
and you run it again, all again and again and again until it passes. And then when it passes, guess what? You've got a T-SQL script sitting right there that's ready to go to production. Done. Well, Grant, I think it's a little harder than that. Mm, not really. Because what I just described, it's probably going to take about three weeks. Oh, God, I don't have three weeks. Yeah, but then you think about the time it saves you down the road. Because now you're doing all these automated deployments over and over and over again. And once you've set up one, how hard is it to get the second one set up? <laughs> Nothing. Third one? Heck, I'm starting to automate how I set them up now. Right? It's easy from there. Cool. We're up to the demo. Any questions on anything I've said? Does anyone have any violent disagreements with anything I've said? Because I'm more than willing to argue the points. Very happy to, as a matter of fact. It makes it more fun. No? Okay. Oops, hang on. We're going to have to reconnect to this real quick. Because we changed the... Uh, awesome. Management studio, right? Yeah, we're not staying in there. We don't need that stuff. Where we're going to is over to here. All right. So what I have running here is Team City. This is um, one CI process. This is a, uh, it's um, what is it? It's not freeware. It's um, pay laterware or something. It's a, uh, well you can you can run it free up to a certain number of servers, or a certain number of projects or something. So it's it's free, but once you start really using it, you have to pay for it. Okay. So this is a great one to get started with. Microsoft actually has a CI server built into um, Visual Studio. That's also very good. I don't think it's as good as this one, personally. Um, but I'm just showing you this one because it, it's, a, it's a freebie. It's available. Um, there's other ones. Um, I forget. Uh, dev guys, give me a couple more. There's like three or four others. Jenkins. Jenkins is the one everybody says. Yeah. Jenkins is like, okay, who, who, here, um, what's, uh, who here is using TFS, Team Foundation Services? Cool. Who here is using uh, SVN, Subversion? Cool. And it's kind of funny. That's most of the room. Okay, so who here is using Git and thinks that everyone's an idiot who just raised their hand? Because <laughs> the people on, who use Git, it's like a religion. It's like, it's like they, they're not, it's not a source control product. It's a way of life. <laughs> Have you talked to anybody who does, who here does CrossFit? Anybody do CrossFit? I do CrossFit. Have you ever talked to anybody who does CrossFit? It's just like talking to the people who use Git. Have, have I told you about how big I can, I can pick this weight up? It's the same thing with the Git people. Man, you don't know. Anyway, so sidetrack. <laughs> Is anybody still using Visual Source Safe? Haha. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so either no one's using it or no one's stupid enough to raise their hand. Cool. That's good. All right, so let's take a look at this. This is really a simple piece of software. and All of the continuous integration software you're going to look at are really simple. What they're doing is, is basically setting up a little paradigm, a little structure into which you can automate stuff. And you could do all this yourself, and I've done it. It's just a lot of work. And when you can go out and pick up one of these tools and just plug it in, it's wonderful. So I, I strongly recommend just cheating and, and getting one of these tools. So I'm going to give it a name. I may give it a description. I'm going to set up however the heck I want to do my build numbers, right? So I can track my build numbers over time. Um, right now, mine's at 28 because I've done, been doing testing and stuff with it. And so you can set that up. And that's the basics. Then you get to set up your version control systems. And, and need, like I said, now I'm, I'm showing you Team City, but don't get hung on Team City. There's a lot of different ones out there. Jenkins is really, really good. I just like this one a little bit better. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not knocking Jenkins. I'll knock the Visual Studio one. There's some actual issues there, but, but Jenkins is really good. Just, I like this. It's prettier. You get to attach your visual source control system. Attach it any way you want to. doesn't matter. No, no, no tricks, no surprises. I'll tell you any place I'm doing something evil. I'm not going to try to hide anything from you guys. This is all too simple. The whole idea is, is that you want to say, well, How's it going to check it out? Well, I'm just going to check it out directly from the server. I can do agents if I need to. I can say, don't check out the files, which kind of makes crazy sense, because why would you do that? But I'm just going to let it set up automatically from the server. 
I can set up custom paths if needed. I can have it clean my files as needed. I can do all kinds of fun stuff as needed, if needed. But basically, all you've got to do is connect it to your source control system. Now, we're going to skip a bit. Next, you would set up your build steps. I'm not going to do that. Not yet. I want to show you the triggers first. You get to add triggers. Now, this is where it gets fun. Most of them work like this, so this, is, this isn't going to be a, uh, stop that. Would you please do what I tell you to do? Okay, cool. That's not too bad. There. I just want to make it so you guys can see it. So, triggers. What are triggers? Well, CI, continuous integration, is a series of automated builds. And so you need to automate how you're going to do your builds. Now, we talked about two kinds of builds initially. Now, you may come up, and trust me, you will, because once you get it running and you go, well, wait a minute, I've got this other idea how we could do this other kind of testing. Wait, what if we, you know, you, believe me, you're going to have a good time. This is a cool toy. But we're going to concentrate on our two types. One is the complete rebuild. Everybody remember? Second is the incremental build. The complete rebuild, what are we going to do? We're going to set up a trigger. What's our trigger going to be? A schedule. I want to do a complete rebuild once a day. It's going to take every bit of changes inside of my source control system. It's going to do a complete rebuild. Now, everything's going to work. Why? Because nothing goes into source control it's unless it's already been tested locally. Right? Works on my machine. So it's all going to be good. No one's laughing. Okay, that's. Clearly, you haven't done this yet. No, it's going to be a nightmare, but you'll figure it out as you go along. You're going to set up a trigger, run it once a day. Or you can set up a trigger so that if you have automated builds already set up, it fires off of that. Or you can set it up so that if you branch your source controlled system, and yeah, I'm not going to get into describing branching and all that fun stuff. But if you branch your source control system, it automatically fires a build process. You can set it up for Maven, which I have no idea what that is. You can set it up so it works with NuGet repositories. NuGet is a Visual Studio um, build and distribution um, package. It's effectively a zip file with XML. Seriously, it really is. It's a zip file with XML. But, but you can set it up with that. You can do any of these triggers, set it up any way you want to, including triggering it off of every check-in of code so that you can, whenever code gets checked in, you can have it build. Now, the one build I do not recommend that you trigger off of code check-ins is the incremental build because the one that's most likely to fail is the incremental build. So I would only build that one once or twice a day. You might want to try initially doing your um, automated full rebuild, the one that has no data, that runs really fast, you might want to try running that off source control check-ins. That could be entertaining, <laughs> especially at the beginning. Once, once everyone's on, on board with the idea of like, don't check in code that doesn't work, it'll, it'll be much faster and much more stable. But until they get to there, it may not be much fun. Any questions on anything so far? OK. so. If you want to, then you can also set up failure conditions. If it runs too, oops, hang on, let me zoom in so you can actually see what I'm saying. If it runs too long, if the, if the build code exit is not zero, meaning it failed, um, if one of the tests fails, um, if there's a crash, you can set up so that it, it does something on failure. What would it have it do on failure? I'll tell you. Email. Who does it email? Everybody. Initially, no. Initially, treat it like that whole clean data thing. Don't, don't email everybody. Initially, just have it email yourself. But ultimately, who do you want it to email? The team. The team should know that the CI build failed because the team is responsible for the CI build. The team cares that that CI build failed. And you get to point fingers and laugh at whoever broke the CI build every day, which is cool. Or is that just me? That's probably just me. Don't be mean like I am. I'm the scary DBA. I get to be mean. But you do want the email to go out to the team. So what is it that we're going to 
fire. Now, there's other stuff in here. You can set up dependencies. You can set up all kinds of other things. You can make it so that it does one build after another, all this other fun, 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 entertaining stuff. Believe me, you're going to get into it, and you'll have a good day. But the steps are what's important here. So now what I'm doing is I've got four steps running. I've got it doing a build deployment package, which is, like I said, using SSDT or one of the other tools to generate a script. Then it's deploying that script from the package. Then it's running a series of tests. I actually have tests set up right now. And then it creates a thing called an octopus release. And I'll tell you about that in a minute, because I want to tell you about some other tools available to you. All of this is done one way. How is it done? Pay no attention to the logos. Oh, crud. Well, nope. Hang on, I'm just going to back up and just tell you. That's bad. Didn't mean to do that. Don't fire me. Don't cut my pay. Oh, wait, I'm not getting paid for this one. Okay, so. PowerShell. It's all PowerShell. Just PowerShell in the background. Yeah, yeah, I know. You saw a GUI, but that GUI just generates PowerShell. Trust me on that. It's all PowerShell. By the way, most of the room says they do IT stuff or they're DBAs. There's a few developers in here. Who here is not, and be honest, not doing PowerShell regularly now. Be honest. Come on. Come on. I don't care. OK. M majority of the room. You're wrong. <laughs> you must start doing PowerShell. It, it's the automation language, and it's going to be the best mechanism for getting all this kind of stuff done. It allows you to take control directly of Visual Studio if you're using uh, SSDT. It allows you to take direct control over third-party tools. It allows you to take direct control over SQL Server. It allows you to take direct control over this tool, and allows you to take direct control over the next tool I'm going to show you. All on the fly, all through PowerShell. There's no way in the world you shouldn't be doing PowerShell. It gives you that automation engine that you need to get done. But Grant, I can do it all through T-SQL in the command shell. No one's saying that, right? Good. So what happens? If I check code into source control, this thing runs. Now right now, and I've left it this way on purpose, I've got it in a fail situation. Why? Why would I show you failure? Shouldn't I? I mean, I'm doing demos. Everyone wants their demo to work. Right? Why would I leave it you know, with red on the screen? Red's bad. Green is good. We all know this. I want to, the failures are the important part. Success is not that important. Success is great. You know what I mean? You want to, you want to succeed. You want to get to where it's succeeding all the time. But first, you want to know that it's failing. And you want to know why it failed. And it just so happens, I know ex exactly why it's failing in this, but we're going to take a look. You get a nice build log. It shows you everything you need to know. What happened? I have a test from less than dot com. Um, Less than dot, dot com, great, great um, piece of, so uh, great blog site, actually. It's a blog site, but they also have a set of SQL Server tests that you can run using T-SQL T, which is a third-party open source um, testing engine. Yeah, write that down, T-SQL T, you want one. And they do, they do a series of tests on the server. Now, one of the tests that failed in this case is that it check for foreign key constraints. It checks all the tables that have you know, primary keys, foreign keys, and if it has a missing foreign key constraint or if a foreign key constraint has no check, it fails. So this failed on a foreign key constraint check, and I can capture that and know that I need to fix it. And that's why I left it up here, so I can show you the variety of stuff that you can test for. It's not just did my build run and do I still have a table. It's all kinds of other tests. Everyone okay with that? Cool. You guys are just being polite now. I know that. Any questions on, on CI in general, T, T, da, 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 Team City? Not, not Team City in particular. I don't want to sit and talk Team City, but, but CI as a process. You've just seen everything there is to do. It's that easy, and it really is. Now, what can you add to it? Oh, hang on. Actually, let me, I forgot one bit. Let me... Uh, yeah, and that's my build log. That's all the stuff that w goes on. And that's just a series of T-SQL commands and the, then the um, PowerShell tests. 
Let's just take a quick look at this. One second, one second, one second. Edit settings. Build steps. I did want to mention this. What can you do? Add build steps. What steps can you add? Why did it do that twice? Every time I hit control four, it zooms back down. So I can add .NET, ant, command line. Oh, cool, I get to use DOS. Yay. Nobody else is bummed. I, DOS, DOS should die. We've got PowerShell now. MS build. You can call MS build directly from here. Uh, MS test, in ant, NuGet package, NuGet publish, NuGet installer. In unit, you can call in unit directly. Octopus deploy, create, deploy, promote. PowerShell, you get to call PowerShell from here, and that's how I do most of my stuff. You get to call directly to Visual Studio from here, or Visual Studio 2003 if you're still doing it old school. All of it directly from here, and so you can set these build steps up to do anything you want. You're not dependent on, well, Grant said I have to do a build, then a new. No. Sky's the limit. You can do anything you can think of to put this together. So you can say, OK, look, copy the production database backup, do a restore, run a script to clean the data after that restore is done, then do a compare between my source control and, and the, that new database, generate a T-SQL script, run that T-SQL script. If it passes, run a series of tests. If those pass, cool, take that script, email it to me because I've now got a script that's ready for production. That's just an example off the top of my head of, of a process you could set up pretty easily. Drop the database, recreate it. And, and we're not going to be pointing at production when we do that. It's one of those things you, you kind of have to tell people sometimes. All right. So we've now generated a T-SQL artifact through that CI process. And that's the only thing, everything else I'm going to show you today, it's pie in the sky stuff. Think about it, yeah, maybe this would be a great idea. CI process, I want you to get to that tomorrow, uh, day after tomorrow. Not tomorrow, tomorrow you're coming back here, right, everybody? Not me, I'm flying to London, but, okay, good. So, automate, automate CI, you know, develop, everything goes into source control, you do a build, you do tests, you do more development, all on and on and on with the idea that you're generating this deployment package. What's the deployment package? It could be NuGet, right? I'm, I'm using NuGet in this case. I'm creating a NuGet package and sending it to Octopus. But what's in the NuGet package? Guess, T-SQL. Well, wait, it's in T yeah, it XML and a zip file with some T-SQL. That's all it is. You can use that to use deployments on databases? Yep. MS build, it works. It's easy. Wait, that means I can make my app code and my database code into the same package with the same version. Wait, that means we'll know which version production is in when we deploy the app and the database? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's the whole thing we're going for. We want a deployment package, right? We've got the deployment package. We've got the T-SQL script that represents production or represents the changes coming to production. That T-SQL script now is what's used to go to testing. I'm not talking CI now, I'm talking your QA team. You send this off to the QA team, to the testers. They're gonna run all their stuff. Let's assume it fails. It goes back to development, that's fine. But what if it passes? The same script. The same script is then gone into staging or user acceptance testing or financial testing or whatever other processes you've got running, right? The same script. If it fails, fine, back to development, no big deal. Run it back through the CI process till it's ready to go again. If it succeeds, guess what? We're taking the same script and we're going to production. Why? Because we've run that script 50 times at this point. I've got no problem dropping it on production. I've got confidence. Now, are you always gonna be able to do that with great, great confidence? No. We have a 10 terabyte database grant. I'm not putting 50 copies of it around my production, uh, you know, around my development team. You're not. So you're gonna use subsets of your data and you're only gonna be testing subsets of the data and that means it's not a complete test. Yeah, but you just said, I just said I can't make everything perfect. <laughs> I'm gonna get it as close as I can. I'm gonna validate as much as I can and before I go to production, I'm gonna feel comfortable. Not guaranteeing you that it won't fail. 
because if it fails, you go back to development and fix it, right? Over and over and over again. Everything is a dry run from production. You want to try to get staging, your pre-production environment, whatever you're calling it, as close as you can. You can use a diff tool, you can use a backup and restore, anything that works. The whole idea is that that means that you're ready to go to production, right? We're completely ready for, kind of funny, I have this up and all the winter games are going on right now. Right, the, the, the Norwegian championships, I've been watching them on TV. Nobody, I'm the only one. Okay, wow, all right. We're ready to go, right? No, we're not ready to go. Anybody ever work for a company where everyone had SA privileges? And I mean everyone, right down to the receptionist. I did. Do you want to know who the only human being in the company who was smart enough not to connect up to the production server and try things? The receptionist. So I started training her to be a DBA. <laughs> you are a smart person. You should be a DBA. I only lasted nine months. I couldn't handle it. Anyway, stuff happens. It's 3 a.m. The phone goes off. There's a problem. What are you going to do? Fix it. Now, what should you do? Well, at 3.45 a.m., after you fix the problem, you should go into source control, make sure that you update the script that you just did on the production server so that it's checked in and goes through the CI process and all that fun stuff. Who thinks they're actually going to do that on a consistent basis? Yeah, me neither. <laughs> Erlen's like, yeah, of course I do it every time. Most of us are probably going to fail at that. So at 8 a.m., we're going to get in the morning there. Even you know We're kind of groggy, but we'll remember to get into source control, but we might not. Right? It, it drift occurs for good reasons. Or everyone has SA, and they're just doing all kinds of crazy stuff. But you're going to have to check before you go to production to validate whether or not the script that you have is really the script that you're going to run, um, and whether or not that script that you're going to run is going to work. Presumably, that's what your staging deployment is done for. I would recommend your staging deployment is done minutes before your production deployment. If you're doing it, yeah, we did it three weeks ago, it's all good. You may want to check first. But now we're ready to go, right? We're all set for production. Eh, things could go wrong, right? We need to have a rollback strategy. We want protection. I'm not saying, you know, if we, oh, we're, we're going to automate everything, so we're done. We don't have to worry about anything anymore. Production will be fine. No, I'm not saying that. We still need to have things like backups. Backups are your buddy. Backups are your friend. You're still going to want to do snapshots, whether it's a VM snapshot, um, a s snapshot from SQL Server, uh, um, you know, a SAN snapshot. Just make sure that whatever snapshot mechanism you use, you can recover from. You're still going to want to do rollback scripts, maybe. I am not a fan of rollback scripts. I am anti-rollback script. You want to know why? Errors occur two ways. One, you do the deployment. It burns to the ground when you do the deployment. Oh, crud. Let me hit the undo of the snapshot. Cool, we're back to where we were. Guys, we have a problem. We have to go fix it. But production's OK. Or problem the way the problem occurs, number two. It's Friday night. We're doing a production deployment. Production deployment goes out, test it, looks good, nothing's on fire, no one smells smoke, awesome. Let's go to the bar, have a drink, go home. Saturday goes, Sunday goes, Monday goes, 3 p.m. Monday. Whoa, what's on fire? Oh, yeah, the, whatever you guys deployed on Friday night, now there's a problem. Oh, well, okay, we'll just run the rollback script. Yeah, cool. You know that rollback script? Does it take into account the fact that you've just added millions of rows of data over the last couple of hours? Well, yeah, it kind of does. It'll only take about seven or eight hours to run. Ah, you're not running that on my production server. So what do we have to do instead? We have to do a roll forward script, <laughs> meaning we have to do another deployment to fix the deployment that we just did. And how are we going to do that? I've got an idea. We'll run it through our CI process, validate it, generate a T-SQL script that works, and then run that through our tests again using the process that we've already built. I like roll forward scripts. I don't like rollback scripts. I don't trust rollback scripts. Does anyone radically disagree? No? Okay. 
Another way you can do deployments is the AB blue-green deployments, where you've got two copies of everything, and you deploy to one, then swap them out. I've only ever been able to do that with data marts, read-only systems. I've never done it with a, an actual live production system. I can't even imagine how to do it. But that's another way to protect it. So, cool, 15 minutes left, right? Doing okay. So the idea, what we're trying to get to, is this. It's not that, it's not that, it's that. I wanna get to a, where I have an approval gate, where I'm able to test things. Oh wow, I missed the demo. Yeah, hang on, I missed the demo. I'm sorry. I don't know whether there's a slide must be hidden by accident. Let's switch over to here. So you remember earlier I talked about the fact that I created this thing for Oct called Octopus Deploy. Octopus Deploy is, is a third party, open source. Again, it's uh, free, to, free for 10 projects or something, um, but then you have to pay for uh, additional ones. Um, Microsoft also has a, a, what's called a deployment manager um, built into Visual Studio, and there's a couple of other third party ones. Um, this is um, the coolest thing since sliced bread. So what you're seeing, which, by the way, sliced bread was invented after uh, Betty White was born. Does everybody, anybody know who Betty White is? She's this crazy actress who does all. Sliced bread, Betty White was born before sliced bread was made. I just, that boggles my brain. But anyway, on the left hand side of the screen are projects going down. Across the top of the screen are environments going across. So you see dev integration, QA, or I'm sorry, it's testing, staging, prod. And the little green thing is showing whether or not there's been successful deployments of my project to each of these environments. So for my project here, movie management, which is the one that we did a CI build of, I've got determinations as to which of the places it's built. And I can go and do more builds. Or I can look at what builds were done. And by the way, what builds were done, look at this. I think this will be familiar to people. It's called T-SQL. I'm able to track the T-SQL commands that I'm building. If there are warnings, I know what they are. If there are changes, I get the list as an HTML. Oh, just open it. Okay, fine. Irritating. I get a list of the changes that I made so I can see what changes came out of it, all directly from Octopus. Oops. I can go in here for the builds, and I can say, wait, deploy this one. Where do you want to deploy it to? I get to deploy it to dev, I can deploy it to testing, I can deploy it to staging, I can deploy it to prod. If it fails, I'm going to know it failed. I'm going to know what's in each environment because I'm deploying them all through here. Grant, I thought you said you wanted to automate all this stuff. I do. Then why are you using a GUI? Well, the GUI is just representing what I've done. How am I doing it? Guess. PowerShell. I'm doing it all through PowerShell. I have get to control each of these processes through PowerShell. And the processes themselves are, guess what? Any guesses? Come on, guess. It's PowerShell commands. It's all PowerShell. It's all PowerShell behind the scenes. So what's this doing? First, I'm running a mirror of production. So I'm running a PowerShell script across any servers called that are in the role of DB server, a database server, but only in my staging environment. So what's that mean? Well, it means I'm making a copy of production into my staging environment, but not into any of my other environments. All the other environments get a raw install of the, of the script that I'm running. Is that the right way to do it? I don't know. It's the way I did it in this case. Then I'm going to create a database deployment. That database deployment does it across everything with the name DB server, or the, I'm sorry, the type of DB server. Then I'm going to get my NuGet package. Where do I get my NuGet packages for? Dev integration, testing, and staging. What word did I not say? prod, because what am I not doing in prod? I'm not running a compare script again. I ran my compare script in staging. I validated that that worked. 
after making a copy of my production server. I've now got a script, and I'm not going to modify that script. I'm not going to regenerate that script. I'm not going to trust some tool, any tool. I don't care who made it. To regenerate that script that I've tested, I'm going to take that script and run it against my production server. If it fails, oh well. Yeah, yeah. But probably it's going to succeed. Then I'm going to create the database resources, which is run a PowerShell script only in dev, testing, and staging. I'm not going to do that in prod. I don't have to because I'm only using the script in prod. I can even add, I can add steps, I can reorder steps, and the steps I can add are ridiculously simple. Deploy a NuGet package or run PowerShell. And it's just all about building out PowerShell. You can set variables so you can control stuff. You'll notice I'm controlling database names, um, controlling the scopes, which server am I connecting to, update paths, all that fun stuff. I get to control my releases based on build types. You get to see when they succeeded, when they didn't, and then you can control other settings and stuff. And then the overview is just that beautiful place of seeing how it's set up. You can set it up using the GUI, but it's all PowerShell scripting behind the scenes. And all this thing does is it's a management tool to allow you to control these things across multiple environments with variables controlled through a PowerShell script. It's just heaven on earth. It's the way to get things done. Any questions on this one? Cool. All right, whoops, wrong thing. There we go. So as I said, the whole goal is to get to there. Once you've got to the approval gate, once you've got that T-SQL script that you've tested over and over and over again, then it's just a question of picking that up and dropping it on production. And, and that's your whole reason for existence, is automate the heck out of yourselves so that you're not doing this stuff manually. And we got a couple minutes. R resources, I wanna go over this real quick because I'm gonna make a recommendation that's painful for me, but, but I wanna make the recommendation anyway. There's some great books on the topic. Um, Continuous Delivery by Jess Humble is fantastic. The Goal um, by uh, Goldratt and Cox is amazing. Um, Agile Organization's got a bunch of stuff. Uh, Redgate's got a database delivery learning program I recommend, um, mainly because I wrote half of it. Uh, um, well, okay, maybe I wrote a quarter of it, but, but anyway, it's still good. The other recommendation I'm gonna make is I'm gonna recommend that you read a novel. It's a horrific, bad novel, really bad novel. It's called the, the Phoenix Project. Has anyone read it? A few people? You were at the MVP Summit and got handed a copy, right? Yeah, me too. He was great, and, it, and he convinced me to read the book, and I'm really glad I did. It's awful. It, it's really, it's a bad book. Okay, the characters are cardboard cutouts. The storyline is obvious. And I mean, and there's got there's one character. He should be called Yoda. He's not short and green, but he ought to be. He just you just gotta call him Yoda and get done with. Now, after you read the book, because you're all gonna go read it, you're gonna agree with me. Now, why am I recommending this? Two reasons. One, it's a horrible novel, but it is an amazing parable. It tells a great story about teamwork and the goals of of a production team a development team is to arrive at a place where you're working together to support the business. Because that, in the end of the day, is what you're supposed to be there for. And it's a fantastic parable for that. And secondly, I worked with every person in the book, it, except for Yoda. I had worked with all those people. I worked on the teams that they were on. I couldn't believe how accurately it mapped the horror show that is IT. And so I really, I read it in a day. I mean, I just ripped through it. But it's a great parable, horrible book, don't get me wrong, but a great parable. So I strongly recommend it. It is a novel about IT, and it just makes me a little ill to say that out loud. But it's worth reading. Okay, any questions on anything that we've covered? I thought I, said I was gonna put up my, I, no, I don't have it. Hang on, I'll back up. I'll put up my uh, contact information so you guys can ask any questions. We've got five more minutes. There. Any questions? Sir? Question. 
Do I have uh, strategies for managing index rebuilds? Well, that's a little bit different than uh, deployments, but I'll recommend two things. Um, two names. One, Ola Hollingren. Everyone's going, yes, I know. <laughs> two is um, Minion Reindex. It's by the, the, D, the Midnight DBA team. They've come up with a whole new mechanism um, for doing um, uh, index management, and it's different than Ola's. I won't say it's better, but it's different, and it's got a lot of it's it's got strengths that Ola's doesn't have. What? Minion Reindex, M I N I O N Reindex. It's very interesting. Uh, um, if you go to SQLServerCentral.com and type Minion Reindex, I wrote a review of it. Um, I was I was kind of blown away by how they did things, so it was it was it's worth checking out. That that would be my recommendation. And everyone's going, yeah, Ola, yeah, yeah, genius, yeah, whatever. Moving on. Any other questions, sir? I would recommend putting your server configuration changes in source control as well. I mainly focus on databases because most of the time you're doing the database changes are the ones that are just going to be doing a thousand of a minute, right? And server changes you're going to do one a, a year maybe, on a good day. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. A DBA, he said a DBA could also have his own version of stuff and, ma and maintain changes that way. And I, yes, absolutely. Sir. Yes. Okay, so the diff tools that are out there, and I don't want to get too much into talking tools, those tools, because it borders on the areas that I, I don't feel comfortable with because I work for a vendor. That said, those tools have different approaches for how they deal with, with um, changes that will cause data loss, and what you'll want to do is look at how those tools deal with that. The SSDT as it is, if it's going to cause data loss, it will stop, and you'll get an error which is fine because then what you can do is create a pre-deployment pre script or a post-deployment script to make the necessary structural changes to protect your data. Check that into your source control and make it all part of the process. It'll work great. The other tools do it a different way, but they can, they can, they can both manage that. It, does that answer your question? There may be manual coding you have to do, in the, but, but when, where are you going to do that? Oh, in staging. No, 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 no. Way back You're at, at the beginning of the process. But yeah, that, 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 that may happen. Sir? Right. It's the same thing. I mean, what's, have you ever, yeah, what he said is, is that when you're doing SSDT, you'll frequently end up with a DAC pack, although you don't have to. You can tell it to generate T-SQL, or you can tell it to generate NuGet packages. Either way, if you get a DAC pack, a T-SQL script, or a NuGet package, what's inside of the DAC pack or the NuGet package? Guess. It's, it's T-SQL. You can unpack them. You can open up a DAC pack and look inside. Don't change it manually. I, I'm speaking from experience. <laughs> I thought I could, quote, fix it, unquote. Yeah, no. <laughs> Horrible things happened. It should have been easy. It looked fine. <laughs> Don't do that. Any other questions? Sir? I don't handle changes in the database that are not in source control. You know how I handle them? They get lost. Because what's that phrase we started at the beginning? If it's not in source control, it doesn't exist. And you're going, but wait a minute. I'm going to do this, or my developers might do that, or. Right. Well, I mean. Everything should be able to go into source control. 
He's saying that he's got scripts that can't go into source control, and I'm just... Oh, they're not there now. Ah, okay, for starting this process, the first step has to be getting everything into source control. Oh, for it's a giant database, the diff scripts may not work, or some of the diff tools may not work. Yes, er, well, it won't be efficient. <laughs> um, that's true. That's going to make automation more difficult, but it still doesn't mean that it's not the direction you should head in. Um, how, how can you deal with that? Um, what I have seen people do is, is break up their databases by um, schema. Let's say if you have multiple schemas, and so you, then you do deployments by schema, which makes it smaller, so you're only checking a, a given schema against a, a, a set of source control, um, or break it down some other mechanism. Um, everything from that point forward is hard. If, you, if you're going to break it down, it gets difficult. Just flat out, I'll tell you up front. Oh, and by the way, the one things I haven't mentioned here that just blows this out of the water and makes it almost impossible, replication. Automating replication through this process, you know, just let me eat a bullet. It will be a lot easier. <laughs> just so you know, just, again, try, try not to, to give you bad, bad information. That is the one thing I can tell you. You would rather shoot yourself. <laughs> Any other questions? Because if, oh, yep, one more. Master data services. I have not tried doing this through ma uh, master data services through this. No, I, I don't have any experience there. I have done CDC through this. It wasn't that hard. It was actually pretty easy. Structural changes are, you know, I mean, there's like a set of scripts you have to do. No big deal. Uh, okay, well, great. Thanks for coming out. Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs>